Usually when you see science is developing a split, the next level of the science is to say that's not really a split, it's just seeing different sides of it, right? So, um, so what we're talking about in higher differentiation is the blessing, but the challenge, that takes place when people bring each other into close communication and change each other, change together. That's what's called co-creation. Low differentiation is where people are, not, are too scared to do that that they feel either they're going to lose themselves <clears throat> or that they're going to cancel somebody else, so they don't bring themselves into a situation where the relationship can involve co-creation. And then the, uh, the last point that we made was that um, uh, lower differentiation, when Bowen talked about lower differentiation, he didn't tell us what on earth people do in lower differentiation, he told us what they don't do. And what we tried to do is put together the talk about the regulatory function and intersubjective function and try to understand that families with lower differentiation are involved mainly in regulation and families that are involved in, uh, intersub in, in higher differentiation are able to allow themselves into the, uh, the workshop of co-creation of intersubjective self-objects. And you'll see in every family there's a flow because there's always some regulatory function. In some families you'll meet you see that you need to stay with them for a while in regulatory function, but not forever, because regulatory function is addictive. All addictions are regulatory. And what you want to be able to do is get to the point where the regulation is secure enough for people to then take the step of taking a risk and enter into the workshop of co-creation, okay? So that's where we put together low differentiation with regulatory function, and into subjective uh, function with higher differentiation. That's a little bit of an addition to Bowen, and uh, we'll see how that works out clinically over time. It's not the absolute truth. It's a good, a useful way of seeing things. Yeah. What is mutuality exactly? So mutuality, um, you should ask Maria, what is mutuality? Mutuality it takes place actually on both levels, right? In other words, uh, uh, regulation is also mutual. But when you speak of mutuality at the higher level, we talk about the mutual co-creation, the fact that people understand that they're not just always recreating their uh, relationships, they're actually growing and changing over time in face-to-face -face communication with each other. So that is uh, uh, what we'll be trying to put together. Is that clear enough? Okay, now, uh, two, uh, th we have sound? No. Um, the video doesn't have sound yet. Okay. Um, you were talking about how Bowen kind of went back to his family and shut things up to, to change it. But what if someone is not able to do that? Like you have a client who's, you know, the, the parents are no longer alive, or there's just no way, you know, there was abuse or something, but they're no way going to go back right. to that. The question is, uh, it, it was nice in Bowen's family that even with the crazy way that he dealt with them, they were all alive, nobody was uh, hospitalized, and uh, it was possible to work with them. Um, that's a great blessing. When you don't have that blessing, the question is, what if somebody's gone? Now, if you think about it, when somebody's gone, a lot of times the work that takes place in mourning is something that's an opportunity for raising the level of differentiation. Something that you couldn't do face to face, you do sort of in retrospect. You will see how you miss somebody, and you say to yourself, most people in mourning say, if I had known, I would have said, remember the exercises we did? I would have said, which means I would have brought something to co-creation, which I didn't bring. So you can uh, then ask, where is that in the rest of your relationships, right? Um, and there are families that are, uh, are challenged and can't grow over one generation. Um, this is something that we'll learn over time. Uh, there's an unfortunate term called intergenerational transmission. Uh, that is an unfortunate term because it doesn't talk about growth. And what it suggests is that pathology, you know, gets worse and worse over time. That's not the way to see multi-generations. But <clears throat> if you look, for example, <clears throat> in our society, if you look at the people who had been through the concentration camps and came out, who were brutalized, they were things they couldn't do. There were many emotional things which they uh, were unable to do. <clears throat> Probably two-thirds of them were unable to talk, and one-third were unable to stop talking. And talking or not talking um, came out to be regulation, right? And so their children uh, couldn't 
bring that level of differentiation to communication with their parents, but if they understood that, they can do something different with their children. And when you try to raise the level of differentiation over generations, that's a better way of thinking than intergenerational transmission. In other words, each generation is challenged. When you see your clients, you will say, these people, they're in a certain generation. What differentiation did they start with? Are they starting to move? Is the, gener is the differentiation in what they're working in now, as a couple or as parents, is it moving forward? The best you can hope for is that a generation moves in differentiation forward. I think, you know, if you see in the, in the, the families of Holocaust survivors, you see that it takes three or four generations to heal. Because, uh, uh, and, but we're not talking about transmission of pathology, we're talking about healing. We're talking about looking for where the co-creation is limited because of pain, because of fear. And how you can take it forward in the next generation, which you can't necessarily begin with at a given generation. When Bowen said, somebody walks into the room with 60 years of, uh, of, uh, of history, that's what he meant. What, where did we start? That's how he looked at himself. He was 50 when he started doing this stuff. He said, you know, both of my parents were orphans. There's now, there's your question, right? What about when you lose your parents? Both of Bowen's parents were orphans, right? So um, he didn't get into that in this, but you know, you, what the people miss is usually like, but it tells you something that he couldn't handle, right? He wasn't ready to look at the fact that his parents didn't have, each of them was missing a parent of the same sex. And uh, um, so there was something that was limited. <clears throat> and then it became the burden of the next generation to try to make that grow and so forth. So when you see a client and you say, what was possible before, what's possible now, what's gonna be possible in the future, you're looking at 120 years of, uh, of work, 60 back and 60 forward. That's the way to think about multiple generations. It makes it easier to see the small changes as very important because the small changes are what makes possible the next change. Whereas the idea of healing the family or solving the problem is a small part of it. It's, you know, sometimes that's a useful way to think, focusing in the room, but it's not a useful way to think in terms of thinking. A useful way, to think, way of thinking is human life. Human life happens over generations. You know, everybody knows that. But the, whenever you deal with the science, the science always has a, has a knife and cuts and makes somewhat of a simpler system. And then you go back into life, meeting people in a room is going back into life. And you can't use the knife. You're in a system that if it helps you to see something, that's good. If it doesn't, find another way of thinking that does until you see something that's helpful in, in creating change. But none of these systems are the whole story. The whole story is the whole story. That's uh, what we call Olam Amulohom. It's a whole world, and uh, you can't chop it up. Um, so far, we're together now? Yeah, okay. So now, um, there was a question that I raised on the blog, which is where has everybody disappeared to? I understand that some people disappeared because they couldn't see the lecture because there wasn't a video. That's going to happen this time too because there's no sound. Anybody here good at lip reading? So we're stuck. Okay. Um, but uh, um, uh, is there a particular problem with the blog that we need to hear about? It's your blog, it's not mine. You know, I created it so that you can have a forum to keep the thinking uh, alive and to allow the, uh, the thinking to progress over the week. So, um, is there a particular problem that I know some people don't have access to the video, to, to a computer, so we're not shooting for more than two thirds. But uh, if we have two thirds of people participating, we're a, a, a live group. If we have less, then we're a partial group. And I'd rather, if you would like to create a live group. I don't make those rules. Those are the rules of life. But uh, is, is there a particular problem with the blog? That anybody felt hurt by it, challenged by it? Somebody say that you're not allowed to take a blog? Nothing in particular. Okay. I think a lot of people want to be part of the one third. <laughs> say it again. Uh, I think a lot of people want to be part of the one third. <laughs> Right, okay, well if everybody's in that third, then we don't have a blog. Um, so, you know, it's always open for people who have things they want to raise, but it won't feel like a group, it won't feel like a live group, uh, unless, um, you know, the default is I open it, and I put in it 
what I thought at the end of the session, at the end of the exercise, at the end of the learning, a thought that I had, a question that I had. That's the default. It's not all that complicated. It grows not because you put in 20 lines, you know, uh, it grows because you put in two lines and somebody else puts in another four and uh, the conversation. So it's, it's really up to you. I will simply be nudging you. There was, uh, um, uh, David suggested that maybe I'm a pursuer and you're uh, running away. I hope not, uh, but, I, but I'm not pursuing. It's your blog. If we have a blog, we do. If we don't, I'll personally be disappointed, but I'll continue blah, 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 blah. I'll know less about what's going on from the other side of the blah, blah, blah if, uh, uh, if I don't hear from you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I posted first because, honestly, it felt like something I had to check off my to-do list. Like, I want to be a good student, you know, but it felt like a chore. And then I didn't even go back and check it until a few days later, and I was shocked that there was only one comment because in the other weeks there, there were other discussions. So, and I didn't even really ask a question. I was just posting some observations, and there was a response. But right. I mean, that is how I honestly feel. It feels like um, something I have to do, and then. Okay, everybody hear that? That's fine from my point of view. In other words, these things don't happen if you say, I wonder if I have. Uh, um, some sort of uh, inspiration today that's going to present me God knows how well on the blog. That's not what the blog is for. So the idea that the default is Thursday, Friday, how come I haven't written anything yet? That's a good default. And all you need to do is put, you know, as you, people would say, where you're holding. You know, what's, if nothing happened in the lecture, then put that on the blog. Say, this lecture was a complete blank and I have no thoughts. That's important for me to know. Somebody else may say, me too, right? But if, I, don't, I don't suspect anybody in this room of having no thoughts, right? So uh, if you have any thoughts, that's what needs to be on the blog. Someone else will pick it up. And that makes it alive. It's, the blog isn't my blog. I mean, I'm talking me, each of you. It's our blog. So if you put your face into it, then someone else will say, gee, you know, I had a different thought, and then it'll grow. And I think you saw that it was starting to grow. And the things that start to grow often stop growing. Maybe we're in regulation right now and not in, into subjective. But um, um, it's a, a, a light reminder that it's, a, it's an opportunity to feel that you're actually a, a group that's learning together. Okay. The, the, But you see, I, I think the best way to do it is what I've been telling I just feel that you have to do it. And do that for a couple of weeks. You know, uh, it's a matter of experience. Nobody here has ever participated in a blog, am I correct? Yeah. Oh, you have? Oh, okay, there you go. And those are the people who have been on the blog. <laughs> okay. Uh, most of the, but the other people who haven't been on the blog, it's a different experience. It's not something that's exactly intuitive, but it is part of the glue of yourselves as a class, and the main learning happens between each other. So, uh, you know, I'm just the stimulus here, but uh, the main things happen between you. If you make it work, it works. I'll just keep reminding you. Yeah. Um, personally, I love the blog, and you know, I told you I didn't post because I missed the lecture, and there was no video, so I have nothing to say. I could have posted that, but, you know. <laughs> um, and I think, um, I, I wonder whether people just, um, lack trust or confidence maybe to post on the blog, but I think it, in theory, could be a very, you know, um, really special, amazing experience to if everybody did share, and I think that it kind of mirrors the intersubjectivity that everyone's bouncing off each other, and it could, you know, sort of co-creation that you're talking about. Um, I think it's exciting. I have to say, I did, the only other blog that I posted on in the past was really an online um, course in my social work degree and it was not enjoyable and you didn't know who anyone was anyway and people used to just kind of write pages of information which was really useful. I think this is much better because it's really personal and the people that do share, it's really genuine. So Okay, so I can't make a better advertisement than that. You all heard it. Um, 
or, or, or you know, put it this way, uh, you all know the bracha of Chacham HaRazim, you know, that you're in a multitude of people, then uh, you have to make a, a blessing about how everybody is different. That there's 10,000 people here, and every single one of them is seeing things from a different point of view. It's personal. Each person sees something different. You want to know something about Chacham HaRazim? Join the blog. That's the idea, that we become smarter when we uh, say, this was important to me, this wasn't important to me, I think this was nonsense, this makes me anxious, this makes me uh, worried about my culture. Those are the kinds of things that uh, each person has something different. So if you look around and say to yourself, how do I want to learn? Do I learn only what I'm taking out of this? Or do I want to make it times 30 or 20? 20 would be good, right? If I want to uh, multiply my learning times 20, that's what the block is for. One last question. Was there another comment? Uh, yeah. I have a comment. Um, I also love the blog. It's just been more. I'm trying to settle into this crazy schedule of getting out of the house. But um, I did my degree online, and we it was a lot of like forum type of thing. And we were learning together for, say, six months, and then we would fly out to a practicum. And it was like we were all best friends because of this whole, we had never met, but it was like we were best friends because of this, you know. Okay. So I do think it's very beneficial. Great advertisement. <laughs> so, some people, but, but you have to get used to it. There is no such thing as a blog in theory. Either you do it or you're not in the blog, right? It's not a theory, it's a practice, it's something that you do. And then you find out that it contributes something to you. So, um, yeah. I think two, two things that I'm thinking of is, uh, I know that there are people that sometimes are uncomfortable speaking up in this room, and I wonder if there's the same feeling for that on the blog where it feels sort of like a public forum, um, the same way that this is. And the second thing is, um, Sometimes getting into, you know, going into the blog, that, that can seem like a chore, which was mentioned before, and that can be a deterrent. You know, like, you know, it's just not going to happen. Right. Okay. Those are the, uh, the, the opposite of the advertisements. Um, are, are people uh, <clears throat> feeling that it's too, too, it's too open? Because, you know, the point of the blog is the stuff that you don't want to put up, you don't put up. Don't put up something you don't want to put up. But the assumption is that within the great, you know, frame of Hacham Razim, there's always something that you can share. And always there's stuff that you can't share. That's the stuff that you do in small groups. Yeah. Um, what I think would help is in the blog is not su like subject to only the class. Like the class, if I want to, let's say, if I write something, and sometimes I write something last minute because this is how I do things sometimes. So, um, if I don't see a continuation, like, I don't go back to the last class blog, it, it feels like a stop and then I start again. Maybe we could have a blog and continue from class to class instead of, like, having the blog connected to that class. Would that be helpful for people? It means a lot of scroll. I feel like there, there's something... I, I second that. I think that, you know, having to go into each week sort of makes it very separate. And if you just have a continuous uh, dialogue, maybe, there is a way to do that. Okay? What's that? There is a way to do that because I accidentally one time posted on right. the main class page and right. I asked the audience to delete it because it's the wrong place, but right. it could be there. Okay. So um, is that a general feeling? Okay. We we'll just have to see how that uh, can pan out uh, technically. It does um, take a, I'd say it does take a long time to get yes. in. You have to put in, you have to do your login again, you have to click. Right, I'll take that up with Javi. There's something that's a little bit uh, uh, slow. Every time you press, you have to press twice. The first time you press, nothing happens. And why that is, I don't know. But uh, um, it, the, the, the computer seems not to want to make it easy. So we'll look at that too. Okay, uh, yeah. Just uh, Now I can't hear you, what? See, this will be an interesting creation because the experience that all the people teaching in the universities where they now do blogs uh, is, is that the blog doesn't work unless you're graded on it. And uh, then it becomes a problem. Unless the students overcome that, 
by making it come alive. So here we have something that's not graded. Nobody's going to be penalized for not being in it. So it'll either come alive or it won't, depending on what, what the use you make of it. So uh, we'll look at the, the technical part and see if we can uh, make it continuous. I don't think it should be a problem. It probably won't appear on the page. It'll appear somewhere else. Um, uh, but, um, well, uh, but that shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. It, I assume that will be helpful for some other people. Um, so I will do that, but take it, you know, like, in other words, the default is, what did I learn that was important? What do I want to ask that's important? But I'll put up something, and you can use that if it helps you, or ignore it and go to the other default. Um, so we'll have both ways. Okay. Um, now, one last thing is at the very end of the small groups, we're going to pass out a... Uh, um, an evaluation form for this course. Barbara will give you one for her course. We want, this is mid-semester mid, uh, mid now, and we want to, uh, it's completely anonymous obviously, but I would like if you could fill it out sometime soon, put it in my box, okay? And so that way I get to understand what's working better, what's working less well, those for whom it's not working well, but you haven't wanted to say it, this is your chance. Um, so, um, um, but we'll do it at the end so you don't get distracted. Now, just one second. We still don't have sound, right? Okay. So there won't be a video for this, there won't be a video for this class either, unfortunately. That's two in a row. Uh, what I'd like to do is to begin by reading a text with you. It's the text that I sent you. It's, anybody read it? People, good. One, anybody else? Some reading? Okay. It's extremely difficult. That's why we're going to read some of it together. Uh, what? What? Yeah, this thing. Yeah, we're going to start reading it together because it's, uh, uh, rather than tell you about it or where it fits in the world, I think the best way to do it is to start reading and seeing if it has something to do with what we've been talking about and uh, mainly with uh, your lives. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at it. It's a work called I Am Thou. Um, it was written in 1923. This is a Richtige Sachen. It's an old, old book. It's still in print. Not many things that were written in 1923 are still in print. It's translated into many, many languages. It was translated four times into French because it's a difficult work. It was translated twice into English because it's a difficult work. It was translated two and a half times into Hebrew. Um, so uh, in a minute I'll pass around the book, but I don't want to distract you. Let's begin by trying to look at it together. Uh, to man the world is twofold, in accordance with his twofold attitude. So uh, we want to stop and think, do I have experiences that are substantially different one from the other? If I would say in my world there's something that's twofold, what could it be? What could be an attitude towards the world that could be uh, substantially different one from the other? Not with a knife. This isn't the book for knives. This isn't the book of science. It's actually a book of poetry. But is there something that's uh, substantially different in how I see the world. And uh, he suggests that I, there are two possible attitudes that people can take towards the world. The attitude of man is twofold, in accordance with the twofold nature of the primary words which he speaks. Primary words is a metaphor. If we read a few more lines, we'll understand what primary words uh, mean, and then we'll ask ourselves, what's twofold here? Uh, the primary words are not isolated words, but combined words. The one primary word is the combination I, I, thou, or I, you. 
If you're Scottish, I thought it makes sense. The Americans later translated as IU because that made no sense in America. Um, the other primary word is the combination I it, which without a change in the primary word, one of the words he or she can replace it. So what do he, she, and it have in common? Third person. What, what is you about? Second person, right? So this is a book about whether in human uh, uh, experience, when we look at something, talk about other people, we'll expand it later, but let's say when I approach another person in second person, my experience of myself and of him is substantially different than when I talk about him in the third person. That's the major move here. The second person is different from third person. Now, um, hence, the eye of man is also twofold. So in case you were thinking that there's an eye, does this uh, resonate with something that we've been learning? In case you were thinking that the eye is singular, actually it has two aspects. Because uh, the eye of I you and the eye of I it, it's not just the you or the it that's different, it's the I that's different. I have a different way of relating. If I'm relating second person or relating third person. Is, does that make that? It's a very strange introduction. Um, it's very culturally bound to, uh, um, to political and uh, philosophical thought in German at the time, so it's not friendly right now. But if we've translated it in a. Does that start to make any human sense to you? Do you, do you have. Can you think of experiences that you've had with another person where you say to yourself, that was second person? We were saying you went to the other. Something happened between us, and when I look at it in third person, I say, well, that person, that's how he is, blah, blah, blah. Nothing happens. It stays the same. Face to face, something happens. Um, so, not in English, but in all other European languages, there's two I'm sorry? Not in English, but in German, French, Spanish, Italian, there's different ways of saying you. There's the vu and the two form. Right. Um, so that's also a different way of relating. The, this is a familiar one. The... This is the intimate you. This is the intimate you. Um, the whole, now, for a German speaker to say that there's an intimate you is very, that, that's quite a uh, cultural statement. But he's talking about the intimate you. So since you asked, this is the Hebrew. This is the other English. This is the German, ich und du. Sometimes it's nice to hold the book in your hands. Uh, in 2028, there aren't going to be any books left to hold in your hands, so this is your chance. Um, so it's the familiar you. What the, you know, in, in, in Yiddish, what people do is they do what they do in German, which was uh, uh, the unfamiliar uh, you is actually the same word as he. Right? Z. Right? Z is both he and, uh, <clears throat> and it's a plural for, for you. And so um, uh, that way, um, is something like a, 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 a third person as well, but the uh, the point is, first person uh, the, the first person changes whether the first person I is connected to a second person or a third person, whether it's relating directly <coughs> or relating indirectly. Yeah. Really confused. Are you talk like when you talk about third person, like um, I it? It sounds like a triangulation. Well, you see, there are different interpretations of this, but for our purposes, I'll use mine. Um, it's just, the it is just third person. That's what it means. That's what this sentence is about. It says you can change it for he or she. But see, how do you relate? I don't get like, In the third person? In the, in, in the third person, I would say, there's this woman in the room who looks such and such and asks the question. I'm, not, I'm talking about you. I'm not talking to you. Right? If I'm talking to you, that second person, right? But the question is, is it substantially different? That's the question. Is it substantially different to talk second person and to talk third person? And Dina has always privilege here. Yeah. Well, what I'm hearing you say, and in response to what Miriam is asking, I hear the it as looking at a person. 
person as an object and at a distance versus the you is a more intimate view and experience of the person sitting with me. And we all have that experience of am I bringing, am I in an intimate view and conversation with someone or am I in conversation with someone that looks the same as the first conversation but I, my experience is I'm distant and that person really exists as an object and not really as a full intimate human being in my presence that I'm connected right. to. Right. If, if you think for yourself, everybody could hear that, so I won't repeat it because it don't sound anyway. Um, um, if you think about uh, deep conversations you've had with another person, and you say to yourself, I come out of the conversation, do I know what they were wearing? Do I know uh, um, uh, what, what they, they brought with them? What do I know from this conversation? And the answer will be, just the conversation. Something happened. I was so engaged in it. Does this speak to you? I was so engaged in it that that's what happened. I can't go out of it and say, well, that person was, you know, really this and that. Uh, something happened in the conversation. That's the second person. The third person is observing. And the word object is a complicated word in every language which it's used, but we're talking about indirect conversation, pointing at something and saying, it's like this, it's like this, it's like that. We'll see it in the text in a few minutes. Uh, and then you know everything about what the person was wearing, um, what expressions, I mean, you remember everything about what happened, but nothing happened. In other words, you remember about them, but it didn't touch you. The second person is where you allow something to happen to you as well. That's, what's, that's, what, that's what the book was trying to get to. Yeah, there was some other, yeah, let's see. You're not gonna find this in the Chobos Lobos, are you? You might. <laughs> you never know. Um, the, the first person that you mentioned, the I, it sounds more like an abstraction. What's that? An abstraction, it sounds like they're, you're not experiencing the other, you're kind of rationalizing the other. Right. One of the ways of uh, not connecting with people is to think about their ego, to think about their pathology, to think about uh, their defenses instead of meeting them, right? Um, so um, that'll be a rationalization. But when you're being smart, nothing's happening. You're being smart. That's a good thing to do, to be smart some of the time, but not all of the time. And uh, what Buber's trying to get to is that aside from the experiences that you can define, you can abstract, there are, there are relationships, there are moments of relationship where something happens which can't be defined and shouldn't be defined. If you try to define it, it won't happen. You have to let yourself be totally in it. Uh, I hope that what we're doing while we're talking about this complicated uh, book is thinking about ourselves, because this is a book that's meant to say, are you listening to me? This is a book that says you to the person who is reading it and says, you know, uh, is this part of your life? This is not a book about how it has to be. We used to say, you know, um, I don't know everything about the world, nobody does, but I'm like a person who's standing at the window and showing somebody else what I've seen. So this is uh, what, what one particular person with a certain set of uh, talents thought he saw in his own life and in other people's lives. So he, was, he was being a third person uh, relationship with the world? Second person. The I, that's me, right? And how do I relate to the outside of me? Either as second person, you, or about you. So, but if he's showing other people what he observes. Oh, what he, he don't take that so seriously. What, what I mean to say is that unlike people who would want to say how it really is, he was just sharing something that he experienced. No, because my next question was, what's going on in this room, let's say between us and you, is that a, a, that a third person or a second person experience? What do you think? I would think it's a third person, because you're, 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 teaching, yeah. you're teaching material and ideas, and not necessarily even you. Right. And those are the less important moments. Hopefully there will be moments where something happens. It's hard for that to happen in a room. That's why a lot of wonderful therapists hate teaching. Because talking to somebody closely is not the same as, you know, in, the, in a big room. But uh, real teaching happens when uh, two people are communicating. Yeah. Um, in conversations with people, 
people that we like respect, like Rabbeim, um, we're sort of taught to speak to them in third person. Right. What kind of impact would that have on the conversation? None. Um, the the you know you'll see Buber says later you you can use the word it and mean you, and you can use the word you and mean it. Right? So, um, um, if you think it's, a, you know, uh, uh, Abhi's raising an interesting question. When you're having a, a conversation with somebody you respect and who is advising you, so is it about the advice, the content, or is it something that happens in the room when you go out of the room and say, something happened that I can't define? <coughs> something happened in terms of uh, a meeting. Uh, and, and it really doesn't matter which form you use. But uh, what Babu was trying to get to is the fact that the two people are open to each other. And uh, a lot of uh, people who talk to other people, uh, they do it partly because it changes them as well. It's something that's important for them as well. Most people actually become therapists around this issue, but nobody talks about it except Uber. That's one of the reasons that we're bringing it in. For example, if you ask yourself in supervision, okay, well, I wrote down every single word, right? And I looked up every single concept, and I came in, I was smart, right? And I made a big impression. And did my supervisor say, was there any moment that really touched you? In this session, was there some moment that you, so you, you can remember that it was there, but you can't actually remember the content? Something that you felt something was moving in you, that at the time, you just knew that something was moving. You didn't ask yourself what is moving. You did that later. You, at the time, felt something was happening. Those are the great secrets of human uh, conversation and meaning. In, uh, uh, in human sciences, people don't ask that question. You know, I often meet with uh, the guidance counselors, you know, and they talk with teachers, and they talk about, about the kid. Well, he's, you know, rambunctious, and he's this and he's that. And almost every guidance counselor would say, a good teacher says something happened to me with that kid. I can't tell you what it is. And a good guidance counselor is somebody who listens and who says, oh, that means something's happening. And uh, the rest will figure out. But two people were there saying you to, e to each other. That happens all the time in the therapy room. The question is if we're noticing it. See, Buber's not trying to be a mystic here and talk about you know, a, a, something that happens once in a blue moon, uh, something that's an exceptional experience. He said, it's under your nose. You just have to pay attention to it. That's what keeps us alive. Um, yeah? I'm wondering on that point, why? I don't know what it is in the German, but using thou rather than you makes it sound a little bit, you know, but that's why it was retranslated. If, if you, well, what is it in the German? If you were, it's, it's familiar you, it's a do, not z. Um, the, um, if you were Scottish in the uh, 30s, you would be familiar with thou. Thou is the familiar form, and the unfamiliar form is the. It's exactly the same as uh, tu and vu, and uh, uh, do and z. And, uh, so uh, those of you who still read Shakespeare, know that people talk in second person thou, and they talk about uh, something else, they say thee, it's a further one. You would never say thou to the king, so you say thee. When he wrote this, people didn't speak thou. This was you made the tra that translation? You weren't in Scotland in the 30s. Go to Scotland, you won't understand the word anyway. So, uh, right? Anybody been to Scotland? Can't understand the word. Yeah. <laughs> Language per se, he's, he's talking about the relationship. Exactly. So even if you use the word see or, or right. like a third person, you can still have the relationship as if it's two. Right. If it's still, right? Right, that, that's same. what I'll be asked before. Oh, oh, right? In other words, uh, um, it's a metaphor. The language is a metaphor. And the truth is that the metaphor only came to him when he started to write the book. He spent a year giving a seminar on this material and uh, at the end of the seminar, we have the seminar, we have the, it wasn't recorded with a voice, but somebody took notes, and a lot of the things that are in the book were said to by his students. And then it sort of all came together at a given moment, and uh, if this is strange writing, it is strange writing. People asked Boober, you know, he was 45 when he wrote it, he lived through a ripe old age for 40 more years. People were saying, why don't you just rewrite it? 
write it normal, write it the way everybody else writes. And his answer was, I would, but I didn't write it. I didn't write this, this came to me. There was something that, you know, was uh, very, I'll tell you about the story when we get to it, but this is the kind of writing that's inspired writing. As a result, it's a little bit hard to, to get to. The translations in English don't make it so much easier. Um, but uh, this is a particular kind of writing which is valuable to look at. Uh, yeah? Did you, we've been talking about you in relation to the personal you and the intimate you and the further you. There, uh, could you give an example of the first person I and, and second person I and third person I? Well, the first person I is just an I. The, the Boer says there are two I's. The one in second person relationship and one in third person relationship. We experience ourselves differently in second person and in the third person. If you're thinking about yourself, thinking about yourself, you can't really meet yourself. So you're thinking about yourself. So you're using yourself as a, as an, as a he, as a him. Uh, the difference is uh, between talking to you directly until something happens between us and we feel that we're talking but something's happening, that we're understanding each other in a way that we, we, we stop thinking about what it is because it's the happening, that's the second person. And the third person is they say, well, you know, Gabriel had this question and uh, um, I can tell you what the question was, but I didn't meet Gabriel, I didn't talk to him. But this happens inside you? It, it happens between us. Between two people. Between two people. But it the, also happens inside. There's every a you and an I. Right. You see, well, what were we talking about? Why do we start, begin by talking about multiple function? Because everything happens both inside and between. Everything. It happens both. It's not one or the other. So if you say, is this something that happens inside somebody? Yes, but not only. Is it something that happens between people? Yes, but not only. Right? The emphasis in this book is on what happens between people. You know the word interpersonal? The person who created the term interpersonal was Buber. Um, it's called in German Zwischenmenschen, which means interpersonal. And uh, that was a new idea developed over the first two, two decades of the uh, 20th century. Before that, there was no such term. Um, so we're talking about something that's also interpersonal. But since people were there, so it's always also inside. They're not exclusive, but they're different experiences. Yeah, it's... When you talk about the benefits of the eyes out, the eye in the in darkness specifically, is there a place for the third person in the darkness? Like, is there a, sometimes a benefit? Okay, in case you didn't hear in the back, the question, which... I'm thinking like... It's, it's a very good question. <laughs> right. When you're doing therapy, is it all eyes out, or is it also some eye it? Are you thinking um, content, or you're just doing process face to face? And uh, you wanted to take it up. Yeah, no, I was just thinking yeah. about that. So I was thinking how it really depends. I think we fluctuate between hyper personality and hyper personality. Fluctuate between the youth and the eight in the room. You know, and then also like when you have youth classes, you sometimes they're more than it because you're you're trying to get the history details, intake stuff, whatever. And then you answer the you later on. I don't know, I think it fluctuates. Right. As we read a little further, we'll get to understand that Boop is not talking about prolonged moments. He's talking about special moments, but not prolonged moments. And so um, you say, well, what do the other stuff do? The other stuff digests it. In other words, something happens, and then you're able to think in a different way and continue to think until another meeting takes place. And the purpose of, uh, uh, of going out of the IU is to come back to it. What happens in the middle? Hopefully things that allow you to come back. Sometimes there's things that don't allow you to come back, and that's uh, less fortunate. But it's not as if you come into a room, somebody comes into the room, looks at you, and that's it. <laughs> Right? Although, maybe some of you have had some prolonged silences with clients, and in prolonged silences, you sometimes wonder, is nothing happening, or is everything happening? There are different kinds of silences. So, what we're doing is trying to make ourselves sensitive to those kinds of moments, and give them what we now call privilege. In other words, to say there's a special thing that happens, which we, uh, we might not pay attention to, because we're not very smart about it, but that it's something that's a core of what that goes on all the time. And I'll tell you one more thing, which uh, since it's close, it's connected to your question. When you're doing couples therapy, 
and it starts to work, then the couple have moments of IU. The couple have moments. The therapist might feel awfully lonely. Or the therapist might feel this is a holy place. In other words, that something is happening between two other people. But I need to shut up and stick my nose out of it so that it can happen between them. That's one of the difficulties in family therapy is once something actually starts to happen, to let it happen and not to be... Because it makes you lonely. It makes you long for it in your own life. And so some therapists stick themselves in and say, I know what's happening between you, and then nothing happens anymore. Um, so that's one of the challenges of doing family therapy. You see, with doing your face-to-face -face therapy, it's not a problem. You are there with the other person. Right? That's why most people like being therapists, because when those moments happen, very rarely do therapists talk about those moments, but when they happen, then it's with you. So you have the blessing. But uh, when you're treating the family, you're trying to create the possibility of that that, that happening with them. Yeah, I'm oh, sure. The, the, does the I, it need to, ha need to happen in order for the I, you to happen? Or technically, if you will work really hard, you could constantly be in the state of I, you? Right. Uh, if, if you got, uh, I don't know how far anybody got, usually the first time around you get to like the page and a half and say, oh, uh, what is going on here? So hopefully the next reading will be uh, easier. Um, there is no way to stay in IU. They are transient moments. They will see maybe next lecture when we do a little science that they take four seconds or ten seconds, something like that, and then you go out and you want to go back in. So it's not as if people have these prolonged uh, experiences of, of IDAO. But what we're trying to do is to notice them and give them a privilege for the importance that they have. Why can't it be for a prolonged experience? Um, I don't know. You know it could maybe just hard if you, if you really practice on letting everything else go and being present in the moment, then you could just have IU all the time. Why, why is IU uh, limited? That's a good question. Anybody want to write a thesis? It's uh, the issue of time and how time is balanced is a very interesting one. And we're learning more about time in brain science as well. Um, and at some point, somebody is going to take the brain and scan it in direct relationship and an indirect relationship and find out that we're almost there, that um, there's something that Buber intimated, imagined, or intuited uh, almost 100 years ago, which we can now show in the laboratory. We're almost there, and as, as you saw uh, in the first paper, the, se the second paper of the first lecture, you know, when you were reading, uh, not the second lecture, uh, the second unit when you were reading about the Stern, so you saw that the latest book on brain function and uh, uh, how we understand people and their brains uh, quoted Buber as saying that was probably the insight comes from this book. So there's something coming around um, that's connected to it. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's an, any answer at all, but when I, I, I just know that from attachment that when a baby and a mother connect, the baby always has to reconnect to itself, self-regulate, and there's a lot of research on this now. Go back into itself and not be able, not stay the whole time into the mother, but go back. And that means when we have connection with someone else and a real connection, we can't stay there all the time because we have to go back to ourselves and then reconnect and then... Right. So there's this... That's, that's one way of looking at the research about babies. The other way of looking about the research of babies, which is Stern's way of looking at it, is that um, the self is being created face to face with the mother. That when you say the baby is going back into itself, the question of whether the baby feels that they have a self yet, or whether that's being created through the interactions with, uh, with the mother, it <clears throat> depends how you punctuate it. You know, um, but there certainly is a to and fro <clears throat> in it, and um, the to and fro is probably connected to two states of the brain, which the last 10 years of brain science have been showing us, that there's what's called a default mode. The default or the resting state is like meditation. You're involved in yourself, and the, um, uh, the executive mode, which is like doing stuff in the world, and our brains are organized differently in those two states, and you can see that people turn back and forth to them, usually rather instantly. You know, that they, when things go well, you can both listen and think. Hopefully, that's what's happening to some of you. 
you're both listening, that's outside, and thinking, which is inside, and you don't notice that you're flipping ways that your brain is functioning. It goes smoothly in, the, in those situations. But, uh, um, you know, we, we need to, to, uh, to see more. <coughs> Boober, it, the, the, one of the more inscrutable sections in the, the, fir the first part of this book is about babies. So your homework, since you raised the question, is to try to figure out what he thinks. Okay, yeah, I'll tell you the pages later, and everybody else is invited to do it with Risey, and um, um, we may even hear about it on blog if it comes up. Uh, let's go a little bit further, because we're gonna break in another five minutes, so let's just try to go a little bit further so that uh, you start to feel that this is a book that you can work with. Primary words do not signify things. They they intimate relationships. In other words, when he says the primary word is both the I and the you, or the I and the it, I connecting to second person or third person, that doesn't refer to something. There is no object there. Uh, they talk about the primary word shows what your connection is, where, which way you're pointing, whether you're pointing to second person or third person. Primary words do not describe something that might exist independently of them, but being spoken, they bring about existence. Somewhat inscrutable sentence, but it means that these are words that refer to process, not the content. This is 100, almost 100 years later, right? These are process words that talk about what, is, what, what I'm doing in the world, how I'm relating to the world, and not about the, which object I'm talking about. So when you say, I you, that's a metaphor for saying I'm turning to somebody second person. And when you say I it, that means that my way of relating is third person. It's about an object, as Dina said. Primary words are spoken from the being. Uh, that could be being, or that could be your, uh, uh, your existence. Um, in which way? If thou is said, the I of the combination I and thou is said along with it, right? That's pretty easy now. When you say you, you're creating the I of I you. When you're saying you, when you're returning to second person. If it is said, the I of the combination, I it is said along with it, when I'm related to something that I'm describing as an object. So that's the I that's created together with it. Now uh, we have an interesting sentence. The primary word I thou can only be spoken with the whole being. The primary word I it can never be spoken with the whole being. That's one of the core sentences uh, uh, in this way of thinking that the I of I you is all of you. You could translate that into more of me than I'm used to using, right? In other words, I'm bringing more of myself when I talk second person. When I'm not, when I'm talking about things, then uh, I'm not fully there. Now, that might sound strange if we hadn't been talking about intersubjectivity um, and co-creation. But the point here is that co-creation only takes place when you're really there. You can't be half there and be involved in co-creation. The I, when you're there, when you're saying you, that means that you're fully there, which means that you're sort of open to things, that you're bringing in more of yourself than you're used to bringing. That's when things change. That's when something happens, right? And when you're describing things, when you're thinking about things, saying blah, 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 no matter how smart you're being, and you could be very smart, you're not bringing your whole self. Your whole self is there in second person, not in third person. Um, now, that's something to ask ourselves, right? In other words, uh, you could say, when people are regulating each other, they're not fully there. When they're understanding each other, they're fully there. But when they're talking in the sense of you, that uh, uh, able, uh, enable something to change, that means you've been fully there. And when nothing is changing, you're not fully there. For example, in a therapy session, when you're thinking about what you're gonna tell your supervisor, or you're thinking about what would Martin Buber say about this, or God forbid what Dr. Flash would say about it, um, you're not fully there. Part of you is outside of this, right? When you're free from that, and you're having a communication which is full, you don't really know what's going on except the communication because you're fully there. There's no part of you that's outside that's looking in on it and uh, judging it. It's there fully between two people. 
That's what we hope to have happen in, uh, in couple sessions and family sessions. That's where differentiation arises, when people are able to allow these sort of uh, IU communications, you take a risk about the risk and the rest of it. We'll pick it up uh, next time. Uh, one last question. So in session, there, there's always a part of you that has to be wondering and thinking and anticipating. In a session, there's always a part of you that's in and a part of you that's out. Since Freud, that's always been the case, but Freud had an interesting statement himself about it. You see, he talked about it in terms of being inside of himself, where he was available to his own unconscious and his own fantasies. Um, and uh, Freud said, it's in and out. You move between the two. You can't always be out and you can't always be in. You move between the in and the out, which is not so different from the movement that Buber's talking about. Freud and Buber hated each other. We'll get to that. Uh, um, you know, two yakis standing back to back, seeing different things and being sure the other guy's wrong. But uh, um, we'll get to that next time. But we're talking about a movement so that you have a movement of total presence and then movements of thinking and digesting it that hopefully allow not to get um, uh, addicted to being smart and so you can then get back to the points of uh, direct communication. So what we're going to do now is try to touch on this in the exercise that we're going to do and uh, um, after that um, we'll meet at the, at the very end Dina and Shira and I will give you the evaluation sheets. That's an I it experience. We'll give you a sheet. You will fill it out and talk about the course. That's not what happens. It's about what happens. And put it in my box. But in the meantime, we're going to uh, try to meet this kind of uh, thinking in ourselves and in, in uh, what happens to us. The, the books need to come back.